Good afternoon. Thank you for joining AARP and Alaska Municipal League for part one of our state revenue solutions conversation series. We'll get started in just a moment. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Marge Stone King. I'm Advocacy Director for AARP Alaska, and I am joined today by Nils Andresen with Alaska Mun Municipal League, Cliff Grow, and Carl Davis, along with Katie Severin, who's the Communications Director for AARP Alaska, who will be fielding our questions. As we go throughout the webinar presentations today, you may type your questions into the Q&A box, and Katie We'll field, uh, screen and field those questions at the end of the hour. So AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization with 75,000 members in Alaska, working to promote the health and well-being of older Alaskans. Alaska has the fastest growing senior population in the country, and most of us want to stay in Alaska as we age. We know that older Alaskans are very civically engaged with voting among the 50 plus significantly higher than any other age group. The 50 plus population in Alaska also has higher rates of volunteering and charitable giving and accounts for more than half of consumer spending in Alaska. So we want to keep them here, keep us here. The work of the Alaska legislature that we're here, we are here to talk about today is critical to ensuring that older Alaskans can age here safely and affordably. When we surveyed our AARP members on state fiscal solutions this year, uh, earlier, th there was strong agreement regardless of geography or party affiliation in opposition to continued state cuts and in support of revenue solutions. Our research showed that older Alaskans are keenly aware of the state fiscal challenges and are willing to do their part to ensure a sustainable Alaska for future generations. Our state is facing budget challenges, as we all know, and must make important decisions about how we can best address these challenges to continue providing health and financial security and economic opportunities to Alaskans of all ages. AARP found an intersection with Alaska Municipal League in our approaches to this policy work in that we seek revenue solutions over continued cuts to state programs and services for, for sustainable living, livable communities that Alaskans can continue to live and thrive in. And I'll kick it over to my co-host Nils to talk more about Alaska Municipal League. Thanks, March, and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Nils Andreas, and I'm the executive director of the Alaska Municipal League. AML uh, is a likewise a, a nonprofit, a nonpartisan organization uh, founded prior to statehood um, and dedicated to strengthening Alaska's local governments. Uh, we have uh, 165 cities and boroughs that we work directly with and in support of uh, to, to make sure that they have everything they need to support their communities. Uh, AML members have um, since at least 2015 identified the need for a sustainable fiscal policy, um, though really work on fiscal policy dates back well beyond that. Uh, I, I found board minutes from 1988 uh, that talks about the state's structural budget deficit. Um, and, and that longtime commitment to, um, to working with and, and, toward, with a, and, and toward a sustainable fiscal future for the state of Alaska is really premised on the fact that as political subdivisions of the state, local governments are carrying out responsibilities uh, where the state can't, uh, picking up costs um, that would otherwise be borne by the state and experiencing when state budget cuts uh, occur, um, the, the need to uh, pick up and fill the gap. Um, and it's, it's that where over the last couple of years, AML members have voted uh, 
uh, in support of uh, a broad-based tax, in support of a state able to address its revenue shortfall, uh, and ultimately in support of a state that can correct its structural budget deficit. And uh, we see uh, this conversation as a way to inform Alaskans uh, about uh, the opportunities, the needs, uh, the ways in which this can be accomplished and look forward to having uh, uh, not just today's discussion, uh, but the, the conversations in the weeks ahead uh, as part of uh, our outreach uh, to our members, uh, to policymakers, and to the public. Thanks, March. Thanks, Nels. So uh, AML and AARP are hosting this five-part series of conversations exploring state revenue solutions. Part one today is focused on setting the stage, including where we're at as a state, how we got here, and what the options are. We'll begin with a presentation by Cliff Grow on Alaska's fiscal crisis, followed by a presentation by Carl Davis on options for solutions. And again, throughout the session, please type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll take those after the presentations. Cliff Grow has studied Alaska's fiscal policy over four decades. He worked on issues involving taxes, the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend while serving on the staff of the Alaska State Legislature and as a special assistant to the Alaska Commissioner, Commissioner of Revenue. He was an invited participant to the Walker Malott Administration's Forum on Alaska's Future in 2015 at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and a delegate to the Conference of Alaskans in 2004 called by Governor Frank Murkowski. He's taught a course he created at the University of Alaska Anchorage entitled Navigating Alaska's Fiscal and Economic Challenges. He co-authored or authored four chapters in academic books published in 2012 about the PFD and Alaska fiscal policy. Uh, UAA's Institute of Social and Economic Research published in 2018 his paper on the unfunded liabilities of the public employee retirement system. And he has been a moderator, panelist, presenter, and or, or organizer of more than a dozen events on Alaska fiscal policy put on by Alaska Common Ground for which he has served as a board member for more than 20 years. Cliff has published three books or booklets uh, in 2020 on Alaska's fiscal crisis and the options that, that and those, those booklets include cartoons and graphics as well as text that he wrote and they are available at cliffgrow.org. Welcome Cliff. Thank you so much, I'm Marge and Nils, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And Marge, I know that you're going to be running my slides. I am. Thanks. So that's the first one. Thank you very much. And, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about how we, uh, where we are and how we got here. So um, uh, thanks, Marge. So the first thing to understand is Alaska is now on its, at least its third fiscal system. Um, and we need to run briefly over the history and understand how we got here. From 1949, um, back, way back when Alaska was in territorial days, all the way to, through about 1979, there was a heavy reliance on a personal income tax, um, for, first uh, levied by the territory of Alaska and then by the state of Alaska, uh, in terms of how uh, Alaska paid for the services provided within its borders. Um, then, in 19, um, starting around 1980 and running all the way to the 2010s, for you know about 35 years, there was a two-part system, which uh, uh, all came about because of the discovery of the supergiant um, oil field at Prudhoe Bay, Alaska's North Slope, and the state of Alaska's um, uh, the fact that they was on state land, the state could get both taxes and royalties from that uh, giant deposit and some other uh, oil developments that later occurred in the North Slope. But so from so for about 35 years, from about 1980 to the mid 2010s or so, there was a two parts to the fiscal system, entirely different one uh, from the previous one. Uh, because the state repealed its income tax in 1980, effective 1979, the two, in, under the new second system, the two parts were, number one, large amounts of annual oil revenues expected to arrive each year in the form of oil taxes and oil royalties. And number two, spending savings that accumulated from um, the surplus. There, there was so much oil money pouring on, pouring in, there was a surplus some of that um, money was saved in the permanent fund. Some was saved in some funds outside the permanent fund. 
And there was substantial spending of savings outside, outside the perm fund, savings that I said that came from surplus oil revenues. That system stopped working about seven, eight years ago. And then there was a very difficult um, transition period um, and to uh, a new system we're in today, the third uh, uh, fiscal system for Alaska, which is heavy spending of permit fund earnings with oil revenues far behind. Um, and so now, um, but that third fiscal system doesn't work and that's why we, we're, we're here today. It's still not adequate. Next slide, please, um, Marge. Um, so a triple, so why, we, why couldn't we stay in the old oil-based system? What happened? Well, a triple whammy hit, three big hits. Number one, Alaska oil production has declined by, by more than 75% since the peak. In the late 1980s, when 2 million barrels of oil flowed through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, uh, known as the pipeline, obviously, uh, in Alaska generally. And that's shown, and in in what has occurred is shown by those blue bars on this graphic. Uh, oil production uh, ramped up greatly uh, on the North Slope after the opening of the pipeline in 1977. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and then, you know, went up to an enormous amount to more than 2 million barrels a day. And then it's fallen, fallen, fallen over the last three decades. It is now around 500,000 barrels a day. And folks, if there's one of the few things I want you to take away now is those days aren't coming back. No one will tell you we're ever going to get to a million barrels of oil, oil production again today. And that Willow decision that, 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 that a federal judge Gleason just released recently, you know, helps, you know, give some evidence of that. So Alaska oil production has fallen by more than uh, 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 three quarters since the peak, number one. Number two, world oil prices shown by the, the gold line are well below their previous highs. Uh, they bounce around a lot more um, than uh, uh, Alaska oil production, but they're way down from what they were at the peak. At the peak. And once again, they're not going to go back to the peak um, um, of, you know, up to 115 barrels a day or so and stay there. That's just not going to happen to bail us out that way. And thirdly, Alaska's oil tax system since 2013 is now more sensitive. It's been changed, so it's now more sensitive for downwards pressure from uh, dropping oil prices. Next slide, please. So the oil revenues cratered. And so what are the effects of that? State of Alaska oil revenues have fallen by 77% um, from fiscal year 2014 through FY20, the, the, the 2020, the last year for which final figures have been published. So we lost more than three quarters of our oil revenues. Adjusted for inflation, Oil revenues per Alaskan are lower than they were before TAPS was constructed. And the big oil money started flowing to the state of Alaska's treasury. People find that very counterintuitive, but for those of us who remember uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, there's been a lot of inflation since then. And of course, the population of Alaska has also substantially increased, although it's been dropping um, um, recently uh, and you know, stagnant and then dropping in, in a lot of places. Next slide, please. Oh, no. Uh, uh, yes, this one. Oil. No, next slide. I'm sorry. Oil revenues have collapsed, and here are the responses. So the state of Alaska has done some responses. The state, as I said before, has spent savings at the, at the, the permanent fund, more than $17 billion in the last nine years, leaving those savings outside the permanent fund in such funds as the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund and the former statutory budget reserve fund. I say former because that's zero dollars in it now. They're, they're left effectively exhausted. Um, there have been substantial cuts in state spending, both in the conventional budget and in permanent fund dividends. Uh, uh, the, one, one metric was through um, the, the budget, uh, there was about 43% cut in the budget, heavily in the capital budget, but in the operating budget too, has been cut substantially um, in recent years. And then there's been a new system created. In 2018, the uh, state of Alaska um, adopted a new fiscal system in which, for the first time, there was a, a structure set up to spend uh, on a single basis permanent fund earnings in the conventional budget for roads, schools, uh, uh, ferry maintenance. And the system is called percent of market value or POMV system, POMV for short. And that POMV system, the, the permanent fund earnings now provide more than 60% of the revenues, and this is of the most common uh, way people think about the budget in Alaska, the Unrestricted Journal Fund. And Alaska is no longer an oil state. I've heard 
for decades and decades in Alaska. Alaska is an oil state. This is no longer true, folks. When it comes to um, paying for the services we get, uh, the state of Alaska is now an endowment state. But the problem is the endowment is too small to support the spending without additional revenues. Next slide, please. So, the result is we're in a deep hole, and these figures come from the Comprehensive Fiscal Plan Working Group of the legislature, a bipartisan, bicameral group of legislators who, who met over the summer to try to come up with a fiscal plan. You can see the sea of red ink um, and uh, see how um, uh, deep a hole we're in. Next slide, please. My friend, a professional cartoonist, Peter Dunlop Scholl, drew a cartoon last summer um, about how he uh, saw this playing out. Next slide, please. So now we're going to the grow flow. Uh, and, and this is, I got my friend uh, Peter Dunlop Scholl, the cartoonist, to do this last summer. So the numbers are no longer, the numbers are a little bit outdated. The flows are still correct. So this is the, how the fiscal system works in Alaska. And we'll go over it briefly. It starts in the upper left-hand corner um, with the oil revenues in the, in the uh, brown oil barrel. And those oil revenues in the form of taxes on oil production and uh, on, and on uh, royalties from oil production go mostly into the general fund. The general fund is like the state of Alaska's household account. And, and the money in the general fund mostly goes to pay uh, public services, like I said, roads, schools, public safety. Uh, okay, so that's the top line across the top. Now, returning to the left-hand side, some of the money in the, some of the oil revenue money each year goes as a mandatory matter um, into the uh, uh, permanent fund, the permanent fund principle, which is shown as that gray uh, safe in the lower left-hand corner. Shown as a safe because the permanent fund principle is constitutionally pr uh, protected. And some of the money, um, yeah, some of the money, um, yeah, some of the money in the, um, uh, in the and so the permanent fund principle is constitutionally protected, that's why it's shown as a safe. And the perfect principle generates earnings or income and uh, on an annual basis, and that earnings or income go into the permanent fund earnings reserve account, shown as that checkbook um, in the middle uh, on the bottom. And that's where the PMV money comes from, the money under the, the spending of permanent fund earnings. Every year starting the, uh, after the legislature uh, passed the, the, the bill in, uh, in 2018, the, the uh, uh, permanent fund earnings reserve account provides money to the general fund, which then um, goes out, as I said, uh, along with oil money as public services and also in, in another Alaska institutions, which I uh, did a lot to help create um, in the lower right-hand corner, permanent fund dividends. Okay, the two other small icons on this uh, growth flow I'll also show you. There is a small constitutional budget reserve that shows a bank bag because although it's constitutionally protected, it is way less protected than the, than the permanent fund principal in terms of uh, uh, amount of votes it takes from the legislature to spend it. Um, and then there's other state revenues which are shown uh, as, as a commercial fishing boat is the icon. I, you could also show a mine um, or a liquor store because there are taxes on, on, on mining, uh, alcohol, marijuana, uh, uh, and then and they also provide some smaller amount of money, much smaller amount of money for the general fund. Critically, both the general fund and the permanent fund earnings reserve account, although not the permanent fund, and that's the Constitutional Special Reserve Fund. But both the general fund and the permanent fund earnings reserve account can be spent by a simple majority of the legislature. Um, and they could, and every penny in the general fund and permanent fund earnings reserve account could be spent tomorrow by the legislature, given that it's in session. Um, next uh, slide, please. I'm going to go over options, but I'm not going to give numbers. We're going to leave that for Carl, the actual um, uh, expert uh, on uh, revenues. Uh, but I want to just generally talk briefly about the options. There's a long run option of spending or overdrawing the current fund earnings. And then maybe if you could then get a constitutional, you could get a vote of people who ask them in the constitution, you'd spend the permanent fund principal until all those uh, dollars are gone. Some observers have seen this as the default trajectory or the path of least resistance, particularly spending all the permanent fund earnings. Uh, uh, that's one long run option. Next option. Next slide, please. Merge. So there's more long-run options. We can make um, additional cuts to the conventional budget um, and or to dividends, either through just discretion, the, this, you know, voting by the legislature, uh, or with a tighter spending limit. Alaska already has a spending limit. It's not generally 
generally been seen as effective. So that's a proposal for maybe having a tighter spending limit, either in the statutes or maybe in the constitutions where uh, constitutions would tend to be more effective. Another proposal has been made to constitutionalize the POMB system. That would be to put the um, current um, restrictions on spending and fund earnings that are currently um, in the statutes that are set up to um, arrange for sustainable spending of the permanent fund earnings and not overspending. But you could take those spendings in the, in the statutes and move them into the Constitution by amending the Constitution. Uh, advocates say this is a, a spending limit um, on the permanent fund earnings, and it's effectively an overall spending limit because, as I said, most of the dollars and budget now come from permanent fund earnings. Another uh, option that I think Carl will talk about a lot is bringing back broad-based taxes. Uh, income tax, sales tax, uh, perhaps an employment tax for education. Uh, an income tax would be a personal income tax like you know, uh, uh, Alaska had between 1949 until it was repealed in 1980. It could either be, you know, Carl will talk about, you know, various kinds of income taxes, I'm sure. A sales tax refers to a statewide sales tax. There's some local governments, uh, a whole bunch of them, well over 100 in Alaska that have uh, their own sales, local sales taxes. An employment tax for education would be um, a tax you would and somebody who's employed would pay on their first paycheck as a, as a, a flat dollar amount. It could be flat, uh, it, uh, on, on, that's how it used to be. It could also be progressive. Um, and so uh, higher income people would pay a, a higher amount. Um, it's, a, it's a slight form of an income tax in some ways. Um, it's widely been thought that it'd be hard to have a, a, a standard property tax in Alaska. Um, but Carl, I'm sure we'll talk about that. There's more long run options as well. You could raise oil taxes. People of Alaska voted on that last year. It failed at the ballot box. The legislature could also so, uh, raise oil taxes on its own. You could raise other taxes and fees. Um, you know, example, there's some talk about raising the motor fuels tax, uh, which is the one of the lowest in the country here, and in some ways the, the lowest in the country in the United States here in Alaska. You could also raise uh, fees for permitting and licensing. Uh, these tend to raise less money than broad-based taxes. Next slide, please. Final long-run options people have talked about. One is perhaps some of the most counter counterintuitive of all, uh, guaranteeing the dividend in the Constitution. And the argument is, is that if you can get the dividend off the table, it will allow Alaska to go to a, a more normal situation of the way states usually work um, and allow the legislature not to be consumed every year by finding over what the level of dividend is going to be. Another possibility people have talked about as an option is dedicating a split or allocate an, uh, an allocation of permanent fund earnings in the budget between the conventional budget, roads, schools, public safety on the one hand, versus dividends on the other. The uh, governor and some legislators push strongly for a 50-50 split, having 50% permanent fund earnings be dedicated forever in the Constitution of dividends. That's one of the thing, big things that the special session that I'm in for now um, is uh, fighting over. Next slide, please. Then there's some combination approaches that are discussed, um, like say instituting new revenues, which would really in Alaska mean taxes, um, um, plus a tighter spending limit, or tying tighter, higher dividends to new, new revenues called stair stepping. Next slide, please. Then there's some short run devices, also called sweeteners or perhaps a bridge. Maybe a jumbo dividend for one year is a way to acquire votes in the legislature for uh, other changes that would put Alaska on a more sustainable path. Similarly, and often thought of in the same way, is overdrawing the permanent fund earnings for one year as a way to then uh, uh, get Alaska on a sustainable path and not do it every year. Next slide, please. Okay, then there's some political barriers here. Um, sometimes called chaos in the cockpit. This is from my conceptualization of Alaska politics. And I just want to stress, Alaska is unlike all other states I'm aware of regarding the politics of spending and paying for spending. So in most other states, you have sort of a two-sided wrestling match between budget beneficiaries and taxpayers. And of course, people would say, hey, I'm, you know, everybody's one of, of, of both simultaneously. But people often think of themselves as being in one category or the other in terms of how they, their self-identification. But Alaska did, does not have a two-sided wrestling match. Alaska fiscal politics are best conceptualized as a, at least five people pointing guns at each other um, in the cockpit of an airplane um, while the plane's running out of fuel. Um, 
And instead of a standard two-time set and wrestling match, we have this hopped up cross between the movies Reservoir Dogs and Snakes on a Plane. Next slide, please. So the way to understand this is there are five gunslingers in the cockpit of this plane that's running out of fuel. And they're defined by what they're most afraid of. One person holding a gun is like the person who most fears additional budget cuts. We're going to put a face on it. We might put a, that of a parent activist in the, in the organization, Great Alaska Schools. There's another person holding a gun, on, and usually two guns, because you've got to try to cover everybody in the cockpit. Um, a, uh, a person who most fears broad-based taxes, particularly income tax. Um, when I think of this group, I think of a, a surgeon I, I met once who had made $5.5 million and had income in one year in Alaska. Because there are some high-income individuals in Alaska who would not like to have, uh, particularly a graduate income tax come back like Alaska used to have. Then there's the third person in the cockpit. It's a person who most fears additional cuts to the proof and dividend. Um, that's a lot of Alaskans around the state. Um, um, but both in urban and rural areas. The fourth person holding perhaps two guns is a person who most fears higher oil taxes. Perhaps um, a, uh, an oil company executive or roused about or some person who thinks that their business depends a lot. Uh, it's an oil services uh, business uh, on the uh, uh, oil industry in Alaska. And the fifth person holding two guns and everybody else in the cockpit is a person who most fears overdrawing in the permanent fund. And this group is the most amorphous but it mostly includes uh, people who want to live, who think they're going to live in Alaska for a long time and not leave soon. Next slide, please. There's some short run scenarios of what we might see in the special session for which I'm in Juno now. The scenario zero, nothing happens. Um, that's entirely possible. There's some small ball where there's some fiscal 22 solutions only that uh, the current fiscal year, which started July 1st, is called fiscal 2020 to in Alaska, and maybe there's just some fixes for the, the budget this year. And a final um, scenario of what might happen in the special session or maybe some later one um, is a big long-term fix. And I want to stress that something can be big and not a fix, um, but a big long-term fix would be sustainable and, and make Alaska more like other states. Thank you very much, um, and I'm always happy to take emails from people at cliff.grow at gmail.com. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for your presentation. Um, I think one of my takeaways is, you know, from it is that it really highlights the uh, the similar effort of the fiscal policy working group that the legislature had to to talk about this structural budget deficit, um, the suite of levers that the state could pull um to try to address it and really the need to probably do a lot of those things at the same time this kind of comprehensive fiscal plan and i know we're not attempting to address all of that uh today or, or even in these next few uh sessions um but um but there is i mean i, I want to recognize there is all this other stuff out there uh as part of a sustainable fiscal policy for the state of alaska um uh, I'll encourage every any, any uh, anybody um, to if you have questions, feel free to put that in the Q and A bar, and and we'll field those later. Uh, but I do want to uh, move toward uh, one of the levers that is in front of uh, us: the the revenues conversation, and what those look like uh, for Alaska. So we're we're pleased to have uh, Carl Davis uh, with us. Uh, Carl is the research director. Um, at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, which is a national uh, tax policy research group, uh, which offers data-driven recommendations on how to shape equitable and sustainable tax systems. Uh, Carl works on both state and federal tax policy issues with a particular focus on new and emerging trends in tax policy. He's nationally recognized expert on transportation funding issues, cannabis taxes, tax credits, uh, and the taxation of e-commerce. Carl's involvement in Alaska policy dates back to 2016, when he began work on a series of reports revealing what different tax options or changes to the PFD would mean for the state's budget and for Alaska families at different income levels. He's testified frequently before the state legislature on issues relating to reinstating a personal income tax, among other issues. Carl, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll turn things over to you. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nils. Um, so, yeah, in the interest of 
a full disclosure, I'm not based in Alaska. Uh, ITEP's headquarters is in Washington, D.C. Personally, I live in North Carolina, but I've been following the Alaska fiscal debate quite closely for several years now, and I hope I can bring a little bit of a, a different perspective to, to what you're confronting and the problems that Cliff uh, just outlined. So um, if you skip ahead a couple slides, one more, um, you can see some of the work we've done in Alaska really briefly. We, um, you know, 2016 and 2017 lawmakers were, were particularly seriously uh, discussing an income tax and other revenue options. And so we did a, a report looking at what former Governor Bill Walker's revenue plan would have meant, not just for the state's budget, but for different families uh, at different income levels. Then we did the same with a revenue bill that passed the House the next year. Um, after that, we have another report looking at uh, a little more big picture. How does an income tax stack up to a sales tax, stack up to a payroll tax or a PFD change? Um, so that's more of a menu approach. And then we did a report last year looking at flat income taxes in particular. So um, if you're interested in Alaska taxes or if you suffer from insomnia, here's a great reading list for you right here. Um, so the next slide, Cliff uh, did a really good job outlining the budget situation that the state's facing. And, and I think part of that, uh, maybe sooner, maybe later, is, is likely going to involve the increases in some taxes or creation of entirely new types of taxes. So what could those be? And, and this isn't a comprehensive overview, but it, it's pretty thorough. I think it's got most of the main uh, ideas and options here. Uh, there are three big categories of tax policy at, at the state and local level, and that's I've organized this table into three columns. Uh, the first is taxes on income. So that's the money people or businesses uh, earn or receive. Uh, second is taxes on property, which is the net value of what people or businesses already own. And then the third would be taxes on sales. Um, that's like an outflow. That's what people, businesses are, are spending their money on, what they're buying. Um, you know, in Alaska, you could add another category here for extractive taxes and royalties, uh, maybe a fifth category for the, for the permanent fund uh, earnings. Um, I, I'm going to focus really on these more traditional revenue sources, though, because part, uh, partly that's what I'm, I'm more familiar with. But also, I think the discussion here is largely about diversifying Alaska's revenue base and into, uh, into other types of revenue. So there's too much here. I'm not going to go into every single option here, but, uh, you know, and arguably that's that's a good thing that this is a very full slide because it means Alaska has options. There are a lot of different taxes that could that could be considered and that each has, you know, pros and cons. Um, but starting in the top left, you know, we know, of course, Cliff said that uh, Alaska used to have a broad based personal income tax. Of course, it could enact one again if it wished. Uh, there are 41 states that already have one of these taxes on the books. Um, short of that, you could do narrower taxes on certain kinds of income. So an investment income tax would be more likely to hit higher income earners on their capital gains and their dividends, for example. Uh, New Hampshire has something like that. Uh, a payroll tax is in some ways the exact reverse. It's not paid by investors or retirees on their, uh, on their, on their pensions and social security. It's only paid uh, by workers on their current salaries and their current wages. Um, another type of income tax would be taxing, say, pass-through businesses. That's like a partnership or a S corporation. Um, a lot of businesses in Alaska, the, especially larger ones, oftentimes the C corporations, pay a corporate income tax. So uh, taxing other business forms like partnerships could create uh, arguably some parity there. Um, there's also, um, and then the last few options here, corporate income tax reform. I don't think you're going to solve Alaska's fiscal problems with corporate income tax reform, but there are things around the edges you could do to raise revenue, like putting in a, a minimum tax to ensure every corporation pays at least something, uh, or maybe making some moves to crack down on uh, multi-state tax avoidance, uh, which you know lawyers and accountants have become increasingly sophisticated at uh, in recent years. In uh, the the middle column, these are property tax options. You know. Some states do have a statewide property tax on real estate, uh, buildings and, and land. Um, you could do that either in a broad based way or you could do it with a very high exemption level where the vast majority of homes are exempt. Uh, 
uh, and only extremely valuable properties are taxed. That would be known uh, sometimes as a mansion tax is the, the shorthand for that. Uh, a real estate transfer tax is another kind of property tax, uh, but it doesn't tend to raise as much because it's only applied when a property is sold instead of that being an annual thing or a biannual thing. Um, also, estate and inheritance taxes, that can be thought of as a kind of property tax. It applies to more than just uh, real estate and land. It applies to you know, any kind of assets held uh, typically by uh, very wealthy people at the time that they uh, pass away. Um, so many, many states have one or both of those taxes. Uh, and vehicle taxes are another kind of potential property tax. That's a vehicle is a type of property people own. Um, the third column here is uh, uh, taxes on sales. So I'm going to talk a bit about general sales tax. That's what most people think of. That's the, the biggest potential revenue source. That, that would be something you pay on, you know, furniture, clothing, maybe food. Uh, you know, most things you're buying throughout the year. The retail sales tax. Um, similar to that is something called a gross receipts tax. Um, in practice, the difference there is that businesses technically pay the tax instead of their customers. Um, but really, you know, the economic evidence is that businesses just pass on that cost anyway. So uh, there, there doesn't tend to be as much difference there as it might seem at first. You could also do, uh, Alaska could implement selective sales taxes. So if you were to do something like tax just restaurant meals or tax just hotel rooms, um, you know, that is something that would definitely impact Alaskans. But I think you would see a pretty notable share of that also coming from non-residents. And so we see, again, something like this in New Hampshire with a uh, selective sales tax just on meals and rooms. Um, the other items on this list are also taxes on narrow kinds of purchases. Alaska has a motor fuel tax, lowest in the nation, as, as Cliff mentioned, that could be increased. Um, also alcohol taxes, tobacco, cannabis, um, gambling is a potential tax revenue source. There's a commercial vessel excise tax. Um, none of these are huge, huge uh, revenue possibilities here, but they're all, they all could be part of a larger package. So they're, they're worth being aware of. Um, on the next slide, I do look at you know, one of the bigger options, uh, income tax, Cliff talked a bit about. And when you say income tax, that, that could mean different things. And this is, here are two things, for example, uh, of the way it could, it could shake out. So this is what's called a distributional chart. You read these left to right with the left being how much is a low income family gonna pay? Then in the middle, how much is a middle income family gonna pay? And then at the far right of each of these two charts, that's what a top earner, a high income family uh, would pay relative to their income. How much of their household budget do they have to set aside to pay tax? On the left, this is what Alaska's house passed in 2017. Uh, if the Senate had passed it as well, this is, this is what Alaska would have right now. It's a progressive tax. Uh, progressive, meaning the effective tax rate tends to rise with income. Uh, on the the idea, idea there being uh, high income families have a whole lot more disposable income, it's much easier for them to afford to pay more in tax, and so you charge them a higher rate. On the on the right, though, is a different type of income tax. It's a flat tax. There's only one tax rate. Um, you could do this in a way that is a completely flat tax in effect across the board where everyone pays exactly the same share of their income in tax. We don't tend to see that in the states. Typically, you know, states decided there's not a whole lot of sense in taxing the poor deeper into poverty. So you'll usually see some kind of exemption level, um, oftentimes made available to everyone, but it tends to be more important for a low income family relative to their earnings. Um, so you can, uh, in this example, that's why the flat tax has a little bit of a stair step kind of at the bottom and then flattens out at the top. But, you know, I think this, this is just meant to show when you create an income tax, it, it could have very different impacts on different families, depending on how you design it. This is two options. On the next slide, um, a little bit of an overview of, of how other states do it. Um, most states have an income tax. The, the red shaded states here went with that flat tax approach I just mentioned. All the other states have some kind of graduated tax. Um, they vary in how, in how progressive those taxes are. They might not shock you to hear California has a more progressive income tax than Alabama, but both do have uh, progressive rate income taxes. The next slide is about sales tax, totally different kind of tax, uh, same kind of chart, different tax. How much could different families expect to pay under a retail sales tax on the stuff they're buying? Um, this 
is what's called a, a regressive distribution. What that means is the tax rate tends to be higher on low income families and, and also on middle income families than it does on very high income families. This effect here, it's being driven by uh, the very high savings rate we see at the top. So the sales tax is a tax on spending. If you're socking away a big chunk of your earnings into savings, then you're not paying the sales tax potentially for many, many years, maybe never. Um, low income families and even middle income families don't have the luxury of a really high savings rate. So the vast majority of what they earn uh, ends up being spent and then often hit by the sales tax. And, and the next slide you know, is, is meant to hammer home. This is, this is really, unfortunately, it's an inescapable reality with sales tax. So these are, the previous slide was, was based on our own modeling. This slide is based on official estimates out of four states that already have sales tax. And this shows how the sales tax varies um, by income level. A, a common thing states will do to bring down the re regressivity of a sales tax is to carve out some necessities. So say, we're not gonna tax your groceries, we're not gonna tax your rent. I think that does make a difference. I think it does make sense if, if you're concerned about uh, regressivity in your sales tax. Um, I, I think it's also important not to overpromise what that can do because a huge portion of sales taxes we see, it's, it's often a third, often more than that, uh, is falling on businesses. And what ends up happening then is that those businesses are passing along a large share of those sales tax uh, dollars to their customers. It raises the overall price level in a state and it raises the overall cost of living, even if it's not showing up on your receipt. So say you know, you're trying not to tax rent. You're, you're a state lawmaker that wants a sales tax, but you don't want to tax rent. Well, if, if you're taxing lumber and you're taxing contractor services, you're taxing tile and uh, sheetrock and every other material, um, you're going to be raising the price of housing and rent, unfortunately, anyway. Uh, same with groceries. You can exempt groceries. Most states do. But if you're taxing the utilities your grocery store is, is purchasing, you're taxing their accountant, um, it, it's most likely the price of food will rise there as well. So um, I think this issue of, of the price level in Alaska, it's such an important one. I mean, we know the price level is already quite high, uh, even more so in, in rural areas. And it's pretty easy to imagine how someone living in a, in a more rural area could pay 50% more in sales tax for the same piece of furniture, the same piece of clothing as someone that lives in Anchorage. And that's just because prices are higher outside of Anchorage. Um, you know, I think it's also important to think about how a sales tax would impact historically marginalized communities. You know, in our analysis of sales tax in other states, we've tended to find that minority groups that have faced discrimination and have lower incomes because of it uh, are often disproportionately impacted by a sales tax. And, and in Alaska's case, I, I'd want to be very thoughtful about what a sales tax might be might mean to uh, lower income native people, for example. I, I think if a statewide sales tax is really going to be talked about, those are the kinds of questions you need to grapple with first and, and try to get as good a handle on as possible. Um, next slide is, is where I just stack these two things up side by side. So we talked about income tax, we talked about sales tax. Um, what do they look like next to each other? Well, in all these cases here where you see the yellow bars being taller than the gray bar, that's an example of an income group that's gonna pay more under sales tax than they would under um, an equivalently designed income tax, meaning an income tax that's supposed to raise the same amount of money. You know, our finding here um, is that most Alaska families would pay less under an income tax than they would under a sales tax. Uh, we, we, we're looking at two $500 million options here, but depending on how you design it, it could be more or less uh, revenue than that. Um, you know, under a sales tax, the, the people that are being charged the highest effective tax rates, uh, low-income families, they just don't have that much money to begin with. So you can tax the poor at higher rates and it'll, it'll impact their standard of living in a measurable way, I mean, that, that's for sure. But in the picture of this, the context of the state's budget, how much money comes in from taxing low-income families more heavily, uh, it's, it's really not that much. And so then what ends up happening is to get a given amount of revenue out of the sales tax, you end up having to levy higher taxes on the middle class in order to, 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 uh, to generate that, that same dollar of revenue. And the next slide is, um, um, not from us, from uh, ICER at the University of Alaska Anchorage. They looked at this same question I'm, I'm talking about here. They put an income tax and a sales tax side by side. Uh, it was an income tax similar to the one that 
uh, Governor Walker had proposed, and they found four out of five families would pay less um, under the income tax option than under a sales tax option. So um, I, I, us and uh, ICE are on the same page on in, in this regard. I think it's pretty clear in the data that for most families, if all they're concerned with is, is paying as little tax as possible, the income tax is uh, uh, preferable in that regard. So uh, if I can switch gears just for a minute, this slide looking not at a tax option, but I think this is important context. Another thing that often comes up as a, as a revenue measure or potentially as a spending measure, depending how you want to categorize it, um, is bringing down uh, the PFD, significant reductions in the PFD. Well, how would families fare under that? Um, I don't think this chart should be particularly shocking to people. The, the PFD um, is, is barely noticeable at the, on the right side of the chart here as a share of income. It's, it's a very, very small slice of income for top earners. Um, on the left, you see exactly the opposite. Uh, PFD is, is a big share of income for families you know, at or uh, below the poverty line. You know, a single parent near the poverty line, if you cut their PFD by $500, that's a thousand dollar cut for her household. That's a five percent loss of income. Uh, it's going to be it'll it'll be noticed for sure. And uh, you know then that's that's just a single parent with one child. If you're talking about larger families. The, the PFD impact can be even larger if you were to bring that down. So that's um, very different distributional impact than say some of those income tax options I just showed. Um, quickly turning to uh, property tax. I mentioned property tax at the outset. Um, you know, it's one of the three types, income, sales, property. Um, this property tax does tend to be the least common at the state level. When states do have these, it tends to be pretty small. You do have 39 states with some kind of tax on property. It might be an annual real estate tax. It might just be a, a real estate transfer tax. Um, it's not a huge source of revenue typically for states, but um, it's something most states have, something that maybe could be part of the, the picture in Alaska. Um, but um, I'll just I have one more slide, I think. And um, if I can leave you with this, with this thought. So I talked, you know, the three main tax types are income, sales, property. And here's one way of thinking about how, how, how do different states approach these? Um, if you think about the biggest option in each of those categories, a broad income tax, a broad sales tax, or a broad uh, property tax, most states have at least two of those. That's 43 states have two of those. There are six states that scrape by with just one of them. Oregon just has an income tax, for example. Texas just has sales tax. Um, and then you, you have just these two red-shaded states here in the league of their own, um, Alaska and New Hampshire. They don't have any of these three major tax types. We, we know, of course, Alaska has been able to, to pull this off for a while with uh, oil revenue and, and permanent fund earnings. Um, but what does the future hold if those revenues aren't going to cut it anymore? And, and so I think this map, it points to two possibilities. The first is the bulk of the map here. You could become more like the other 48 states and enact some kind of broad-based tax. It, I mean, that would probably be an income tax or a sales tax. Um, if that's not in the cards, though, long run, you know, this map would suggest your other option is to become more like New Hampshire. Um, they don't have huge oil reserves or in, in New Hampshire and endowment, anything like that. What they do is, well, first they have higher state taxes around the margins. So they do tax investment income. They have some higher business taxes. Their motor fuel tax rate is double the rate in Alaska. Um, really, the, the main way New Hampshire raises its revenue, though, is with the highest local property taxes in the nation. They're about double uh, the local property tax rate in Alaska right now. So I think this is saying you know, this is something that, that Nils alluded to. If the state's not going to step up to the plate and raise more revenue on the state side of things, it's likely you see over the long run more and more funding responsibility pushed onto localities and, and possibly there's a New Hampshire style uh, fate awaiting the state here with much, much higher local level taxes. But one perspective, at least something to think about. And uh, that's all I have. I hope that was, uh, hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. And uh, now we're going to go to our audience questions. And Katie Severin, uh, AARP's communications director, uh, what's our first question? 
Hi, Marge. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question that came in through the Q&A, and I think it, it may be best on the heels of Carl's presentation about methods of taxation. Uh, the question is, does a gross receipts tax generally take less administrative or government costs to manage? And I think that question may have been in comparison to a consumer side sales tax. Um, if does it take less, I, probably. I, I, it's, it is one of the simpler taxes to administer. And because it applies to such a huge number of purchases, not just that final purchase being made at the cash register, but all the sales being made along the way and on, along the supply chain on the way to create a product, um, you can often see these levied at, a, at, a, at a, what looks like a low rate in statute because um, it's such a, such a large number of transactions being affected. The, the problem here, and I think those are, those are two reasons we do see some states that have these, and you can handle a low rate and relatively low administrative costs. The drawback that economists often point to with a tax like this is, is it, it's really high risk of, of creating distortions in the economy. Because say you have you know, a product that has to change hands, you know, a complicated product that's changing hands tens times on its way to being, uh, becoming a finished product and being sold. Well, it's being taxed 10 times along the way then. And, and so you, you have this potential for a whole lot more pyramiding. If you're raising a lot of revenue from the gross receipts tax, but none of it is showing up on people's receipts, it's, it's being collected in, in this more opaque way. Um, and you end up with, with differences in how much tax ultimately, being, ultimately ends up showing up on different kinds of products. And so um, I think that's, that's the big drawback, but ultimately there are a lot of parallels to a sales tax. I would say it's the closest relative to it. Thank you, Katie, what's next? Sure, we'll move to another taxation question. Um, very, very Alaska specific with an income tax, how can we be certain we capture those who work in the state but live elsewhere? Yeah. Um, Right, non non resident. They would definitely get some revenue from seasonal workers, non resident um, people who are in the state temporarily. Um, I think ICER's estimate was seven percent of revenue would come from non residents in that way. And I'm sure there's you know there's some uncertainty around that. Um, you know, there is no federal standard now and any federal limit on. Um, uh, how long someone has to be in the state in order to to, to raise revenue from them, uh, from 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 their earnings in your state. So it definitely would not only be paid by Alaskans. It, it would also be paid by people who come to Alaska to to earn money. Um, they would pay a portion of it as well. Thank you. And so, as a reminder to our viewers, you can put your questions in the Q and A box if you're on the Zoom webinar. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can type them into the, the chat there and uh, Katie will bring them to the table. Sure, thanks Marge. And um, I wanna move to a, a big picture question. Why are we having a revenues conversation and why is this not a mag matter of reducing the budget? That's a question from online. Cliff, let's start with you. Um, the budget has gone down um, by, you know, 43% is a figure that's, you know, been used for the last um, eight years ago through through last year. Additionally, um, you know, the, 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 the spending when adjusted for inflation and population is now like what Alaska did in the 1970s. And then we have more of a practical test in uh, 2019, February 2019, a few months after Governor Dunleavy was elected governor, um, he proposed um, some substantial budget cuts and reallocations that would have not have totally filled, you know, the uh, end of the, the, the deficit, but have gone a long way toward it. And Alaskans apparently very substantially rejected that. Um, the Matt's Manuscus is in the school district, uh, Governor Dunleavy's own home, home district, said that 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 budget might have meant would have would have probably meant that the district would have had to have 50 or more students in a classroom um, and that you know they couldn't get 50 school desks desks into the classroom so i do think that that um uh the budget uh two things so the budget has gone down in recent years since the, this uh, squeeze started and additionally another critical thing that to piggyback off something carl said 
In Alaska, because of the state constitution and our, and our traditions, the state of Alaska spends and pays for a lot of things that local governments do in other states. Um, the biggest example would be schools. In, in Alaska, um, the state of Alaska pays for about 75% of the cost, total cost of K-12 education, where around the country, my understanding is it's more closer to 50% is paid by the state and a lot more paid by local governments. Um, additionally, the state of Alaska also pays for uh, jails, pro uh, prosecution, and um, other things that are traditionally handled by local governments. And so that's another sort of, there's both a policy choice there, but also a constitutional choice because the state of Alaska's constitution has a number of mandates for spending of what the state of Alaska's you know, government should provide. Niels might want to add something to that as well given his substantial knowledge of the relationship between the state and local governments in Alaska. I'm not the panelist here. I, I okay. appreciate uh, the questions that are coming in and, and looking forward to more of them. Thanks. And Nils, I know that you took questions via email from your audience as well. Did you have any questions? I guess, um, one of the questions I had for Carl that, that came in, you talk, so the, the list, I mean, there, there's a long list of potential revenues or, or taxes. Uh, the income category versus the sales tax category and sales tax, you talked about it as kind of consumption focused. It, it seems like from the question, often people think about income tax as, as taxing production. Is that accurate? And what's the effect of either of those? Does taxing consumption reduce consumption? And is that a good or bad thing? And does taxing production reduce production or does it increase kind of relative to the tax? How, how does an individual or uh, an economy kind of respond to one versus the other? Yeah, I mean, I think at the, at the levels of, of state taxes, um, you, you're not going to see a huge response. I mean, the, 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 we, we uh, recently modeled some two and a half percent flat taxes for Alaska. I mean, these are very low rate taxes. You're not going to see a huge economic effect from that. If, if you know, businesses are basing their uh, production decisions on a two and a half percent tax, I mean, they're, that, that, that's a very shaky business model to begin with. So, um, you know, the one thing you, you may see in a, a, a lower income area, for example, um, if you are relying on more, say, regressive taxes that are soaking up a larger share of uh, low income families' income, that that's going to reduce their purchasing power, right? Because they're spending almost every every dollar that comes in just to make ends meet, and so any any dollar that has to go out in taxes is a dollar that's not going to be spent in the local economy. So I, I would worry about that maybe in, in areas where there's a large uh, share of, of low-income families. Um, but yeah, I mean, on the income tax side, um, I think that's the, the idea is there is that's more calibrated based on ability to pay. That's that's kind of the intent of it. In, income is a measure of what you can afford to pay. And if you're thoughtful about how you craft it, you're charging people an amount of money that they can afford. And it, and it shouldn't be a uh, have a huge distortionary effect because of that. And we are about out of time. So I'm gonna ask Nils to close us out and preview our next session. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I will note that there was another question in the chat bar that came in about the mission of ITEP. And I uh, did post that um, uh, in the, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but if you go to itep.org forward slash about, um, I think Carl, that's where your mission statement is. So that should be helpful for folks. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining AML uh, and AARP for part one of our revenue solutions conversation. Uh, I want to thank our speakers again for, for their participation of high level, where is Alaska at? And then uh, very directly, uh, here are different revenue options and their distributional impact and, and what they mean. Uh, we encourage everybody, uh, we hope you'll join us, uh, register to join us for the next four Thursdays uh, as we talk with legislators about each of the potential revenue solutions that are out there. Um, next week, we'll be talking uh, about oil taxation. Uh, 
um, with uh, with Representative Andy Josephson, and I think uh, Senator Josh Revac were waiting to confirm. Um, and then the, the weeks following uh, go from other revenues to uh, sales tax to income tax. So it's the full suite of options. Uh, but we'll hope you, you'll join us uh, next Thursday, September 2nd at noon. Uh, if you haven't registered for that, you can sign up at aarp.org forward slash AK. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.